our today's luncheon. Uh, lunch will be served in room 203 and 223. So just two rooms. Okay. So what's coming up next is the uh, presentation by our third keynote speaker. He is an assistant professor at the Journalism and Media Studies Center, the University of Hong Kong. He specializes in news literacy education and misinformation ecosystem research in Asia. He founded the Asia Pacific Digital Citizen Network in 2013, through which he has been leading an international collaboration among media educators and journalists in Asia to develop pedagogical methods and teaching materials in news literacy that take into account the culture, media landscapes, and political climates in different countries. He is the creator of the chief producer of two massive open online courses in this field. As of April 2018, the two public open online courses had tens of thousands of registered users and more than 10,000 of active learners from over 140 countries. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Assistant Professor Dr. Masato Kachimoto. Thank you. All right, um, good. Well, thank you very much for inviting me um, to such a great conference. Um, I hope that my presentation also contributes to the body of knowledge we've been accumulating uh, since yesterday. And before I start, I also have to tell you that my presentation is mostly for those professors and instructional designers and cameramen and video editors who are actually producing MOOC content. So, so to speak, uh, my target audience today is those frontline soldiers who are creating content for those MOOC platforms. Uh, my name is Masaru Kajimoto. I'm from the University of Hong Kong. And my topic today, as you can see on the screen, is lesson learned pedagogical insights and media production techniques gained from making MOOCs. Now, I have been involved in MOOC production since 2014. The very first MOOC we launched was in 2015, January, and we call it Making Sense of News. At the time, I had another colleague, uh, Ann Kruger, who was helping me to develop the course, and I also had two technical staff who helped me to uh, produce this course. So four of us uh, created uh, this course. Uh, we, it was a session-based course, six-week course. Uh, we launched it in 2015, and we also ran it again in 2016. In 2016, we decided to try Coursera because that seems to be a bigger platform than edX. So we moved on Coursera in 2017, and for this project, I actually partnered with Stony Brook University. They have a center for news literacy. That's my specialized area, news literacy education. Um, and Stony Brook University is part of the uh, State University of New York. And I am also an affiliate professor at the Stony Brook University. So it was natural for me to reach out to them and ask if they are interested in collaborating um, in developing MOOCs uh, for Coursera. And luckily for me, SUNY was also already a partner university with Coursera, so it was relatively hustleless to do a joint MOOC. So this course, Coursera course, was actually offered jointly by two universities. One is our university, and the other is uh, Stony Brook University. And as you can see, my team has expanded. Me and Ann Kruger are still there but we also had help from five other people from Stony Brook side. 
Um, we gave a similar name, title, Making Sense of the News, News Literacy Lessons for Digital Citizens. And as you can see, we got 4.8 stars out of five <laughs> in reviews, if that means anything. But anyway, just to give you an idea, uh, here is a promo video that we created in 2014 to promote our MOOC. And I'm going to talk a lot about video styles today. And this first attempt is very old-fashioned because both Anne and I used to work for, you work for CNN International as a journalist. And all we knew was a broadcast style, professional-looking videos. And that's all we knew. And that's what we did uh, for this uh, promotional video. We reused this video again in 2015 and 16. So the years you see might not say 2014, but it's the same video that we created four years ago. So just to give you an idea what the course was about. Uh, let's first define journalism. Why do we need news organization in our society? As a news consumer, we don't know the information we see from social media is true or not. The big organizations, they have this whole process of verification. Many of us no longer need to look for news to stay up to date. News instead follows us everywhere. News is at our fingertips all the time. Our patterns of media consumption have transformed dramatically in the last 10 years and we are facing new challenges. For instance, when we see a piece of news about a street protest on social media, we often react immediately by liking, retweeting or commenting without knowing if the information is actually authentic. Even though, of course, you don't want your friends to take to the streets based on the false claims that you share. We often make decisions based on what we learn from journalists. Which country to go to for our next vacation? How to follow a healthy lifestyle? Who to vote for in an election? We are living in a world where your personal video can trigger national and international conversations about social issues such as women's rights and cyberbullying. This online course is about becoming a smart news audience in the age of social media. We apply critical thinking skills, make use of online tools and discuss what today's journalism is all about in order to tell reliable information from the problematic. Do you think you're a smart news consumer? I would like to say yes, but I don't think so. So as you can see, the course is about news literacy. Our idea is to educate future news consumers to be smarter when they encounter questionable information in news reports, and which happens all the time, as you know, especially after 2016 presidential elections in the Philippines and also in the US, we are keenly aware of what misinformation could do to our society. So back in 2014, we are already thinking about how do we teach news literacy to the public, not just students we have on campus, but more broader um, audience. So that's the reason why we created this uh, course, and we've been running it ever since. So 2015, 16, 17, now 2018. My Coursera course that I showed before this video is still ongoing, so you can sign up anytime. Um, it's self-paced course, and every week, new se every four weeks, new session um, opens. And we still have probably around 8,000 active learners as we speak. Number goes up and down because some students finish the six-week course and they leave. They are no longer active. So I'm going to talk a little bit about statistics and analytics as well later. Let me skip to... Okay, I'll just go... I'll just skip the video. Uh, let all right, so I think after running two MOOCs for three years and a half, we could confidently say it's received relatively well, more than 
what we expected. So for example, this comment, hands down one of the most successful MOOCs on journalism and news <laughs> media literacy education, said by me. <laughs> right, <laughs> obviously, right, I, I should feel this way. No, but I mean, joking aside, um, these are some of the uh, comments that we got on Twitter. Uh, we encourage students to comment on our um, course content and also have lively discussions on Twitter. And we thought social media is a better place to communicate than um, edX and Coursera. I mean, students can also post questions, but that sounds a bit more academic and uh, Twitter seems to be a bit more free, so I cherry-picked some of the <laughs> comments, you know, that are very positive about our courses. Um, now, I also got this comment. This is not from me. <laughs> right. Um, this one actually came from editor-in-chief from Harvard Business Review. So we were doing something right, I believe. Um, on top of that, Arizona State University, the university has been mentioned a few times yesterday and also today. They have uh, this school called Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. They have an initiative, a project called News Core Lab. So they try to identify um, best journalistic practices, best journalism educators, and best of you know, things in our field. And News Core Lab also uh, gave us um, the status um, best practice in education in news literacy and journalism. So there are certain recognitions that we got um, by offering this. So those of you who are thinking about developing MOOCs, uh, it does give you a wider exposure as an academic. I mean, before I, do, I did MOOC, I was relatively unknown professor from like, you know, small place in Asia. But after um, doing this MOOC, it seems like that many people can recognize my name because we are getting some publicities through uh, these courses that we offered. Um, if you are in the US, you know, Facebook has been having lots of fake news issues and they wanted to do something about it. So in 2017, they decided to sort of have news literacy component to their service. Right? So again, this is only available in the US, but if you use Facebook there, and if you, this, you know, there are lots of different things they are trying, flagging false content or linking to some news literacy education materials from the Facebook. So if you look at one of those help pages to tell users where to get educated in news literacy, we are one of the partners that Facebook identified. So, again, um, we didn't do too bad. <laughs> but <laughs> if someone asks me, have you really achieved what you wanted to achieve in the first place when you were thinking about producing MOOCs in 2014, what you wanted to do, and have you actually done it after three years and a half? My answer would be this, you know. I don't know really how to make those faces, but that's my reaction. You know, I'm not really, I haven't really done what, we, what I wanted to do, and that's the main topic today I wanna talk about. So, this is a big thing, right? Um, previously, we talked about how Coursera changed its strategy from open education for everybody to, you know, how can we make more money <laughs> type of style, um, model. And I felt exactly the same way. When, we, when I first heard about MOOC, this is what I had in mind. We wanted to attract upper secondary school students, or if you're in the US system, senior high school students, who do not have any interest in news in the first place somebody who has no access or not thinking about university education, even though they're in high school or junior high. Right? In other words, we wanted to reach out to those people who 
are very unlikely that they will come to my university. Right? Uh, university level education, I do it every day on campus. I have my students and I interact with them and you know, I teach them and also teach me many things, that's fine. But for the MOOC, if we are making an extra effort to put our course on the internet for the public to take and consume, we wanted to think bigger. So we decided, okay, we wanna target age group between 15 and 19, right? So we sort of rejigged our university curriculum. It's a 14 week full semester course, our news literacy curriculum, but we shortened it into six weeks and we got rid of many like, you know, uh, media theories and other concepts so that it's more digestible for younger learners. So that's what we did. But again, this was already mentioned yesterday. On those two platforms, edX and Coursera, you can only attract people who are already very highly educated. So on edX, um, many of the learners we have, what well, we had, had bachelor's degree already. Many had master's degree. Some even had PhD. Right? Most students finished high school already. Yeah? If you look at age group, most of them are about 25 years old. And 30% of them are actually you know, more than 35 years old. So we weren't really reaching to the target audience we had in mind in the first place. Uh, Coursera is a bit harder to track down because they introduced this um, certificate system. We can only track down like you know paying learners, and most of our active learners are not paying for the course. They sign up for the course, they go through the instructional videos, they do in, in video quizzes, but they are not allowed to take assignments, for example, because they're not paying, and we don't really know, you know. Um, if they finish the course or not, because there's no indicator for us to take a look. Um, so we relied on entrance survey, and this is from the first week, and that's why I didn't put the percentages there. I mean, sample size is only 180 something, so it's not really representative of what we have. But again, you can see the same trend. Many of our learners are very highly educated, and many of them tend to be very mature, we have a sizable group of people who are in their 60s and 70s. In other words, those retired um, professionals or academics or highly educated who you know, wanted to learn a little bit about news literacy. So here is the dilemma we had. What we wanted to do with our MOOC is to tell, well, I don't know what the good analogy is. It's maybe swimming. Right? So we wanted to attract people who do not know how to swim. So we wanted to tell them, this is how you swim. We wanted to teach how you swim. But, so we opened a swimming school. What happened was, instead of those people who cannot swim will come to us, those people who already know how to like, you know, swim in freestyle, they just wanted to know how to do breaststroke or backstroke. Right? So... <laughs> So, thank you, yeah. <laughs> right, so of course, if you already know how to swim, learning other techniques is much easier, right? That's why we got the good reviews, because they were already halfway there. We just nudged them a little bit with our course content, and that wasn't really difficult. What we wanted to do, on the other hand, is to teach how fun it is to learn how to swim, right? Swimming can be an improvement that will like, you know, enrich your life. That was the <laughs> message we wanted to give. So some of the techniques we used to attract those people um, are these. So let me show you some. So first uh, video on the left top, obviously it's the very traditional way of doing MOOC, right? Me in front of camera, just speaking about some of the concepts that we're going to go through. Um, in this particular video, I I'm talking about press releases and how it's written by PL professionals and how journalists treat those 
press releases into their news reporting, how that can be problematic for the news audience. So that's the concept. And I just talk and talk and talk. And if you have taken MOOCs, most MOOCs take this style. Professor just talking, a talking head, right, for six minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And there are some links and readings on the website, but that's pretty much what you have. So we wanted to try something different. And the next video, uh, top on the right, um, shows two students that we have on campus. And we gave the same assignment that we assigned on MOOC to our students and have them discuss how they did the assignments. And we filmed them and put it on the MOOC so that our idea was that, well, you know, let our students do the assignment and sort of let them discuss. And that discussion can be an educational moment for online course learners because obviously we can't really see how students uh, communicate with each other. We have tens of thousands of learners and the forum page is massive. You get hundreds of comments a day, so it's impossible for us to um, monitor those. So that's our attempt. Um, this video is around one minute, so I'm going to play a bit. So Audrey, I think for the first item, we both agree that it's important, probably because it concerns everyone's money, it concerns everyone's finance. But I think it's quite interesting because we all can be investors. That means everyone can relate to this piece of news. So I think it's interesting to everyone in society. That's why I put it quite high up in, in the interest scale. Right, right. I think I, I put it sort of a little lower because I think that um, ordinary uh, people, more often than not, if they're readers, they would look at a piece of news that is about, you know, bureaucracy and it's about banking and they'd sort of write it off as boring and they probably would, wouldn't find it as interesting. I think it's, I agree that it's very important just like you, but I just think it's quite difficult for journalists to make it seem interesting and so for consumers it usually wouldn't seem interesting. So we use this as sort of like a prompt to tell the online learners so these are the kind of things our students are discussing with this particular assignment. Now what do you guys think? So that's how one of the techniques that we tried uh, in our MOOC. Um, next video, key lessons. That one is another thing that we tried we, I talked to lots of instructional designers and professors who have done MOOCs before, before we launched ours. And they all told me that, well, your video has to be less than six minutes. It has to be really short, right? And otherwise, people don't watch the entire thing. So, uh, so I did that. But still, sometimes <laughs> it's really hard to talk about a high-level <laughs> concept in six minutes. So what you end up doing is that instead of doing 20 minute video, you just produce four different five minute, four or five minute videos. <laughs> and then students have to continuously watch that anyway. Um, and I thought since we're doing that, probably we will also make a one minute summary. So every week we had two big concepts that students had to go through. For each concept, we created one minute summary video. If you didn't have time to go through these five videos, you can just watch this one minute video. And that sort of summarizes um, what this particular concept is about. So this key lesson video is around 45 seconds. I think my colleague Ann Kruger talks about editorial decisions. So I'll play back. So what are the key take-home messages on our topic, editorial decisions? Well, each one of us, including someone working as a professional journalist, has a different set of values. Our editorial judgment can be very different. News organisations decide what to present to the audience based on their judgment, which includes how important an issue is to the public. Editors know their target audience, what's trending and what's likely to get the audience's attention. So smart news consumers should pay attention to the news items that others deem important and interesting as well. So we had that kind of really short, bite-sized uh, lesson summary for each concept. Uh, the last video, has, which has no sound, uh, we also try to have another student go through forum pages 
and I ask her to sort of solicit frequently asked questions and some of the discussion points that many learners are struggling to understand. So she picked up those um, questions and some of the points from our forum and in this case sitting with Ann Kruger she sort of, you know, did a Q&A with the professor, and I did this too. So in other words, we couldn't directly communicate with the online learners, there were just too many of them, but we had student helpers to go through their discussion forum and then pick up some of the issues, and then those issues are discussed in studio with me and my colleague, and we filmed ourselves and put that video on our course as well. Right? So let's say, for example, in week two, there's certain concepts and week four, we put that video up. So, hey, by the way, do you remember what we discussed in week two? And here are some of the questions we got in the discussion forum, and here's the, what we think. So that's the technique we tried. Now, <laughs> the strange thing is that this very old-fashioned video that me just talking, if you look at the exit survey, in other words, those learners who finished our courses, we asked them what was most effective, uh, what did you like most about our course, and what did you least like about the course. Surprisingly, that boring talking head lecture video <laughs> was rated the highest. They thought it's really, you know, they learned a lot. Student discussion was okay. Some students liked it, but many thought it was kind of, you know, not really helping. One minute key lesson videos, we also put that on Twitter as well, because it's one minute, right? Why not? The viewership was really low. So, those online learners were not even clicking. If you look at the backend analytics, you, we realized that the summary videos, we thought it's a fantastic idea, but students are not really clicking because, you know, <laughs> for some reason, they watched the uh, talking head and that was enough for them, I guess. Um, Q&A with the professors, having student representative in the studio, uh, same. It was very mediocre uh, ratings among the learners who finished it. So some of the things that we thought helpful wasn't really deemed helpful by learners. That's something that we learned hard way. And it was very confusing for us because, uh, oh, okay, I'm just, because, okay, let me go back. I also wanted to show this, yeah, before we talk about that. So not only those uh, techniques to engage with the students, we also, our video, if you go through them, we have some fancy animations, colorful graphics. Um, on the left top, we maybe talk about how journalists gather evidence and some are direct, some are indirect and whatnot. Uh, so we have fancy animations and everything. We also have um, sound effect, funny sound effect. Um, on the bottom, Right side, you have another colleague of mine from Stony Brook, Stephen Reiner. He used to be a producer for a news show called 60 Minutes in CBS in the US. So we had him as a host for many of our lessons. And just to show you how we use sound effect. This is because the news we all yearn to consume and share serves three primal needs. News alerts us. News diverts us, Pokemon, go! and news connects us. So we tried all these to you know, make it a bit more fun uh, and enjoyable to run. And the confusing thing is, yeah, to jump here. <laughs> other educators loved it. So when we created a course, we, of course, we you know, told other journalism educators around the world, hey, we created this course please take a look at what you think. They loved it, right? We have lots of librarians taking our courses because they teach information literacy uh, in many countries, and they thought our material is very useful for their work. So we got lots of feedbacks from librarians. They loved it. I used those, some of the videos on my own campus teaching as well. I did blended mode, I did flip the course. So we tried different ways to teach. 
My students loved it, especially because it's much easier for them to review what we discuss in class. Because I put all the videos on the Moodle, that's a closed um, online learning system that we use at our university. And so students can go through the videos and then sort of, you know, instead of rereading the textbook, they could just watch the video to review what we discussed. So students loved it. And also we told many of our ex-colleagues, journalists, to take a look, and they also liked it. I mean, journalists are a very cynical bunch. They don't say they loved anything, right? I mean, journalists are the kind of people that, you know, if your mother said, I love you, son, okay, let me dig into that. That's the kind of attitude journalists have, but many journalists liked it. So anyway, my point here is that we were getting lots of positive reviews by our colleagues other professors, journalists, librarians. But if you look at learners, they have a completely different view about what we did, right? All those efforts for animations and student engagement didn't seem to really strike the code. Instead, monotonous talking head was valued highly, right? So in the end, the same dilemma. This but is really big. Right? Uh, people loved it, but we are not reaching to the target audience we wanted to reach. Right? Um, so that was the major problem we are having. Um, so if I think my message here, at least from my experience, is that you really have to know your target audience. If you're producing MOOC to educate other university students, probably our approach is a recommended way to do this, right? Um, but if you are thinking about public education from a different perspective, probably what we are doing wasn't good. So starting from this fall, either September, October, we uh, now reimagining what the MOOC should be like, what public education should be like, and we decided, okay, let's ditch Coursera, which, let's ditch edX. Yeah, that's not what we wanted to do. We decided to go where people go. In other words, our target audience lived, I can say live, <laughs> on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, not so much on Medium, but Medium is a place where you can actually have real long text, so we are considering using Medium as well. So these are the places where we go. Um, we called a new project called, Strap, called Strapline, that's the name of the YouTube channel. It already exists, but again, we don't really launch this project until September, October, so it's the world's premiere, if you will. Uh, uh, of this um, new project. We call it News Literacy for the Rest of Us. In other words, we clearly wanted to target those who we couldn't attract before. And we completely changed our approach uh, with the strap line. Um, this video I will show you next is a teaser. Um, so it's, that ha has no educational content. It's just uh, to tease what's coming in this project. Um, it's around, well, less than two minutes, I think. So let's have a look. I hope Roy doesn't get mad at me for using my sleeve. Uh, but, uh, all right, that's a little better. But basically, I gotta get to work. Hey, hey. what's up? Did you guys get the news from Masato? What when message? Is? Well, today is uh, June 21st. He wants the first batch of videos by July 10th, so... What? Crap. That's a bit tight. That is pretty tight. So, we've been doing this MOOC style video for quite a while and it's okay, but we're gonna try to do something a little bit different. Something that we don't normally do. But the problem we have now is that our fearless leader, Masato Kajimoto, 
he's not here with us to give us direction. Where in the world is Masato Kajimoto? I think he's in Italy, Vietnam, Singapore? I don't know where he's at, but we're gonna try this on our own, try to do something a little different, and hopefully it's gonna look okay. Lunch. Good. So you might be wondering, who am I? Nah. Well, my name is AJ Limanau, and how did I get this job of talking to you guys about news literacy? Well, it seems like I just volunteered. Basically the reason being, I want to learn more about news literacy, and at the end of the day, I don't want to look like a chump fallen for fake news. So that's why I'm here. And hopefully you guys will learn with me about what is fake news and also about news literacy in general. Check out my new pet. Look what I found. So windy and so hot I can't. What is the definition of fake news? Educational vlog. This is an educational vlog. <laughs> so, um, right, I don't know how you feel, but if you feel like, um, is that really MOOC? Is that educational? Probably you're not my target audience. <laughs> For this, what we did was we decided, okay, we gotta know what they like. So we set aside three days. In front of computer, we watched popular YouTube videos for three consecutive days. Six, or six hours every day for three days watching YouTube videos that had millions of views and hundreds of thousands of followers. And it was a torture for me. <laughs> I couldn't get it. Right? Some of the video, just two dudes playing computer games and talking absolute nonsense for one hour and a half. It's got six million views, one million subscribers, right? Another teenage girl who is apparently uh, very good at teaching how to wear, you know, different uh, brands, uh, cosmetics, that, that's fine, right? But she does just, she, her video doesn't just do that. She talks a lot about her life on and on and on. Again, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, the actual cosmetics tip is like five minutes. But then that video gets 7 million views, 8 million views. Whereas our educational content, it's, you know, we, our effort, we only get probably 600 views on YouTube, probably 25 likes. It's not even a comparison, right? So we decided, okay, we don't care what our colleagues think, right? We don't care what other journalists think. We try this approach and put it on YouTube and other social media platform and see what happens. So next video is the very first video that we talk about fake news. And again, this isn't really a deep university level instruction. It's just a YouTube video blog that talks about that topic. Let's take a look. This is around three minutes and a half. Welcome to this episode of, would you call this, fake news. For this challenge, you just have to do a couple things. Number one, you gotta watch this video clip. And number two, you gotta tell me if the news stories mentioned in this clip is fake news. All right, cool. Roy, roll the clip. Um, just five minutes ago, my friend Chen, he's right over there, but five minutes ago, my friend Chen sent me a message that reads, Dude, stop eating Oreos. They are as addictive as cocaine. It's scientifically proven. You know what? I'm going to check it up on the Google search. Hmm. Well, we got one by Huffington Post, The Atlantic, Forbes. 
So yeah, it looks like some news outlets did write about it. Uh, the links do work, so it doesn't seem fake. You know what? I have a friend named Roy. He has a kid who likes eating Oreo cookies. I'm going to share this to him just so that he knows what's going on. Go. All right. Oh, wait. Roy just sent a message. It's almost like he copied and pasted that one. And it says, hey, AJ, you're wrong. This is fake news. Have you actually read the stuff? This article is basically talking about a small-scale lab experiment on rats, not humans. Hmm. So, how did it go? Was it too hard? What did you have to say? Well, if you said it was fake, well, that's a bit of an issue because the news articles, the news stories, the information in them was factual. And if you said it was not fake, well, that's also an issue because the headlines were a bit misleading. Confused? I am. Well, let's check out what Masato had to say. He says, Hey, AJ, who cares? They're both correct and incorrect. What does that mean? Huh? Masato! What the hell, man? This is Ladies Market, and what you notice here is that there's lots of goods. Uh, it's a big tourist area, and a lot of stuff they sell is... I mean, I guess I'd call it fake, which is kind of a interesting forced analogy of sorts, but kind of ties into our fake news. It's kind of a cool background, right? Anyways, one thing you might be wondering is, what is the definition of fake news? Because it is confusing. I mean, for one thing, it's hard to discern, and another, people these days are calling information and news that they don't like as fake news. But Masato says that what's important is not knowing what the definition of fake news is, but knowing when to recognize problematic information when we see it, of which there are lots of different types. Of which there are a lot of different types. Of, of which there are a lot of different types. One last time, I just want one good one. The next episode is going to change your life. So what we are trying to do is to sort of hook the audience. And if they want to know more about the topic, we provide places where they can go. So these videos that we put on YouTube and Facebook and whatnot also comes with a link. And that link goes to our website. Um, this text will also be replicated on Medium as well because that seems to be where people go for, you know, uh, long-form journalism and also longer text. So if you go to our website and if you click the same episode title, which you call this fake news, and which I can do that now, then we have a little bit more explanation in text. So we give a bit more context to the video. You don't have to read this, but if you're interested, you can learn more about this topic. And we have that instruction for the students. And we also created for teachers section. So if you are high school teachers, junior high teachers, who are thinking about using our material, this is what you can do. So for the teachers section, I get a bit more pedantic, so to speak and then provide some links to academic papers and the research articles or more easier readings for the students so that teachers can give to the students if they want to use readings. So here, one suggested activity is to create a table on their own. So teachers have to have students to create a chart and talk about different styles of misinformation and whatnot. Um, so that's the approach we're going to try. Again, we're going to be starting this in September, October. We don't know if it's going to work, but that's what we will try. 
that's my team. Um, it's AJ, me, Roy, and Chen. You've all seen them on the video. So another thing we are trying to do is to build our characters. <laughs> it's a YouTube channel, and we are learning a lot of, from those like TV dramas and other comedy programs rather than educational content to mimic what they do. Don't know if it works or not. Um, right, and I think before I finish here, um, this is one thing I want to emphasize. So we forget uh, we are no longer doing structural sequence. The next episode is going to be on clickbait. So we sort of talk a little bit about Oreo cookie headlines as well and how that can be problematic. But the following episode is about Instagram and the photojournalism, news pictures. So it's a completely different topic. And the following episode, we go to Singapore because three of us, AJ, me, and Roy, will attend another workshop or conference in Singapore. So we're going to film there and then talk about press freedom in Asia. So each episode, we <laughs> talk completely different uh, topic, and we are OK with that. Because again, we are no longer structuring our course. We just keep doing this. So may, we might revisit the same topic six months down the road, nine months down the road, and then create a new video. So that's how we approach. And also, we are talking about um, other like-minded educators in Asia to localize this. And when I say localize, we are not talking about translation. We are not talking about giving subtitles or voiceover. We want to create everything completely from scratch. Um, so if you are interested, uh, I'm here. And we can talk after the speech. But what we, uh, at the moment, we got initial kickstart funding from Google uh, to uh, launch this strap line. And if this goes well, we are expecting to get a bit more funding from other sources uh, to localize in Asia Pacific. And at the moment, we are working with NGOs in Myanmar. And they're talking to national TV station to do something like this. Again, the concept remains the same. We're going to be their sort of guide. But our local partner has to create everything from scratch with local talent, local videographer, and obviously in local languages. Because sometimes talking about news is very cultural. And political climate in each country is very different. So we can't possibly just translate what we do in English into different languages. So. All right, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, my email address is in here, so if you want to contact me, please feel free to email me. Thank you very much. So we apply the same rule. Uh, one question, please, because we are 15 minutes behind the schedule. Thank you. Thank you, professors. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I really uh, appreciate for your valuable experience. And what I found is the creativity, the way that you are present your video, which is the main media that you try to deliver. One, uh, the only questions that I would like to uh, consult with you is about what kind of the technology that can improve this main media to, uh, you know, to tailor the best to fit our target audience. What kind of the technologies that in the future that you might apply? Okay. Um, again, uh, this may sound very counterintuitive, but what we learn from binge watching YouTube videos is that technology doesn't really matter. Lots of popular YouTube videos are produced very poorly from our standard. There are lots of jump cuts, sound quality is low, and some kids filming himself and the mom suddenly come in and he doesn't even edit that out. So I don't think it's the technology, it's the content and it's also, I think, for me, YouTube video is all about like character development. In other words, you know, you feel like you know this person, therefore you watch their video. And I think that kind of charisma 
is necessary for you to be successful. That's why I, I, I asked AJ to do this. I cannot do that on, in front of a camera, but AJ can pull it off. So I asked him, I mean, he's a good friend of mine, hey, AJ, can you do this, you know? I'll, I will teach you the concept, but you have to internalize it and somehow make it funny. And he did an excellent job. So I think not the technology, but who? <laughs> You know, who's going to be on, in front of camera? That's super important, in my opinion, <laughs> if that answers your question. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Our next uh, and the last keynote speaker this morning, uh, he's quite familiar to us because he has been involved uh, with the conference for the past few years. He is the Deputy Director of Thailand Cyber University Project under the Office of Higher Education Commission, Ministry of Education Thailand, and he is also Vice Dean in Educational Innovation Affairs, Faculty of Pharmaceutical Science, Geelong Kong University. He's got his PhD in Educational Communications and Technology with uh, the background of Matter of Science in Computer Science. Uh, he's involved in many TCU projects, uh, and uh, he was also one of the teaching team who taught the first MOOCs in Thailand e-learning professional certificate program, the first MOOC STI course opened on August 2010. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, may I present Dr. Anuchai Tira Reung Chai Si. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's my great pleasure to we come here to present briefly the update of uh, Thai MOOC by Thailand Cyber University. And also a great pleasure <laughs> because this is uh, uh, the last presenter uh, on the, at the lunchtime. You, heard, you hear a lot of uh, content on knowledge and maybe you are very tired and very hungry also. So I promise to present very short and brief about the update of uh, Thai MOOC. Okay. Uh, let's start from the topic that I would like to present. I will present in uh, four short topics. First, please allow me to review the uh, uh, background or history of the Thai MOOC, and then the outcome of the first phase of Thai MOOC. And then uh, the national policy 20 year, we call the 20 year national strategy of Thailand. Very new and very, uh, update, very, very uh, interesting. And then the update, uh, the new uh, uh, vision of the Thai MOOC. Okay, uh, many of you may know that uh, from 2015, uh, our government has launched a new policy called Thailand Digital Economy. At that policy, they are aiming to create the, the digital society, the digital economy platform framework that will raise the nation to have a more income nation. And one of the pillars is the digital society. And one of the uh, strategy is to do to encourage to support the lifelong learning of all people in Thailand. Back to the Thailand Cyber University project. Under the Office of Higher Education Commission, Ministry of Education, the project was found in 2005. We did a lot of uh, project on online education starting from the 
open courseware portal in 2005. Uh, we opened the, the portal for university to share their open courseware and success very much and a lot of uh, people, faculty members and students utilize our portal. And then we start to open an uh, e-learning professional certificate to educate, to training uh, the faculty member, the teacher who want to do the online education. This is a MOOC style uh, certificate program that uh, we launched. At that time, we did not know that this is a MOOC style course before. Then uh, we uh, launched a project called TCU Globe Project that interconnect or open courseware portal in Thailand for some uh, university portal and to the international many regions and uh, very success too. And now we plan to launch the MOOC project. But uh, at the same time that the government run the digital economy policy. So uh, we combine with, uh, partner with the three ministry, three organization. We uh, submit the proposal to, uh, to establish the Thai MOOC. You can see that uh, three major ministry, Ministry of Science and Technology, Ministry of Education, and Ministry of Digital Economy and Society. At that time, uh, the name is the Ministry of uh, ICT, but now become Ministry of Digital Economy and Society. <coughs> Uh, our vision is to establish Thai MOOC as a, as a lifelong learning space for all, all Thai. This is our uh, imaginary Im uh, vision and imagine that if we have a portal of a MOOC course that can support uh, every person from children until their retire retirement age. So, it will uh, support the lifelong learning of all people. We have to create the MOOC, port, MOOC course portal. We have to create the, the learning portfolio system. And also, the very important is the credit bank system that uh, collect the, the credit that the, the learner has passed. We separate uh, duty among ministry. Uh, Ministry of Digital Economy take care of the infrastructure, the computer, the, the technology things. Uh, Ministry of Science and Technology by, by Nectec take care of the software and platform, customize software, uh, modify and create new software. And then uh, for TCU, under the Office of Higher Education, we uh, uh, develop the content uh, with, with the support of the university. Uh, outcome of the first phase, uh, we got three major important outcome. The first is we got the Thai MOOC platform <coughs> that uh, uh, provide the Thai uh, MOOC course to all learners. We adopt for an, and customize from open edX software. <coughs> and then we got the standard and guideline for MOOC course development. This is the foundation, this is the, the guideline that we use for anyone who want to develop the MOOC course and uh, to uh, open and deliver via the Thai MOOC platform. And at last, we have 195 MOOC course uh, developed uh, from the university uh, throughout the Thailand. This is our system, our platform. You can see from the uh, the bottom side, this is the MOOC LMS that we adopt from edX, and then we also uh, integrating to the testing and credit bank that we looking forward that the uh, learner from the MOOC course can go to uh, testing in the test center, and then uh, if they pass the record of success, we will record in the test bank. So it's a uh, uh, strategy to encourage them to go further uh, higher education. Uh, the learning journey uh, similar like this. The students who learn as their own intellect, they stop after pass the course and get the certificate. But the one that who want to collect their credit, 
running credit, they have to go to the testing center. And then if they pass, the record will uh, keep collect in the, the credit bank. And uh, if the home university of the student allow, the uh, credit will transfer to the home university. And if they collect as many uh, credit, they can transfer to certificate or degree. Okay. And in the underlying, you can see that there are many things that we have to done. For example, uh, the infrastructure, the quality assurance system, uh, the guideline, the administration system, and also the supporting system. This is the MOOC, course, MOOC website. This is the standard and guideline. We developed the guideline with the support from the uh, faculty member, the researcher from the university. Uh, the guideline uh, have the process along the MOOC course development. So uh, emphasize on the quality uh, in each step of the process. We got uh, 195 MOOC courses from the seven regional uni university networks. Totally, we have nine, but at first phase, uh, seven university uh, network uh, participate in and join us. Uh, the result come out uh, at the stati statistic from the July 18, uh, 195 MOOC courses open. 70,000 uh, learner register and 121,000 uh, course registration time. And the most popular is the, the basic photography course, 4,500 uh, learner. Yeah. And the second one is uh, psychology in daily life. This is the, the uh, demographic of the age of the learner. Uh, if you uh, think back at, at the yesterday morning, uh, Professor William uh, from the to the to the, you can see that the, the pattern of the, the distribution may be similar. But the age of the learner, the medium age of learner in Thailand may be in 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 the very popular, very famous course is 31. And you can see that the student in the university is only uh, one third, 31 percent. And we have uh, a learner that uh, have more than 41 years old, uh, 70, uh, 17 percent. This similar pattern to other courses. So from this, we learn that uh, maybe now <coughs> we are ready for uh, online education, and maybe not only the younger, the, the university ages, but also all people from all ages. Maybe the, the adult learner or the retirement also can learn from this way of education. This is the map. This map shows the, the, uh, the location of the learner. You can see that the yellow dot spread throughout Thailand. Uh, this is the, the uh, education of the learner. We have uh, after bachelor and before bachelor degree. Okay, the impact of the first phase come out that uh, in Thailand, uh, from our observation, MOOC get into the mainstream of uh, open education. Uh, at least to university level, MOOC platform was launched uh, from the top top two university, Chulalongkorn University runs Chulamook, and uh, Mahidon University have uh, MUX, and at least uh, maybe more will come in the near future. And the last number of university instructor uh, show interested in, use, uh, in developing MOOC course and providing education via MOOC course. Uh, we can see that the application form that submit to get fund from the Thai MOOC Second phase, uh, we have uh, rise, uh, increased 100% uh, uh, from the, the first phase. So many uh, faculty members interested in. And also, uh, at the, there are many national institutes have introduced and used, have, have strategy to use 
move as one of their strategy to do a staff capacity development. Uh, for example, the Office of Civil Service Commission take care of the education of the all Thai civil service and also Thai Professional Qualification Institute that take care of uh, capacity building for the skilled uh, worker, skilled people, and also the Digital Economy Promotion Agency, and many, many uh, public organizations interesting in. Now, MOOC has been widely accepted as an education system for lifelong learning. We can see that at the national level, uh, the, the uh, 20 years national development strategy that uh, newly launched mentioned about uh, using MOOC as a way to provide lifelong education. This is the 20 year national strategy. They have six key strategies. The key strategy number three is development and empowerment of human capital. There are many sections and mention about the lifelong education, mention about the transformation of learning, and also MOOC is one of the keywords that was mentioned in the national policy. So this, this come out of the situation af after the first phase. Everyone uh, get into the uh, MOOC, UTLI MOOCs, uh, not only the university, but also the public organization all uh, involved or uh, participate in the MOOC. How can we take this good opportunity to benefit the future of, of Thai education? Back to the, this picture, from the learner side, from the learner side, uh, what is the thing that motivates them? They want to get knowledge. They want to uh, advance in their career. They want to get more higher degree. This is the motivation. But also, they need something not complex, not sophisticated. They need one-stop platform or unified platform. They just learn to use this platform only once, and they can learn everything. They want their portfolio of learning to be consolidated into one portfolio, not separate into different and, and, and many, many uh, platforms. They want to collect, collect their learning credit, and then they can use their learning credit into uh, everything that, that they want to further their education or to advance their career, something like this. Back to the provider, the MOOC course provider. There are many universities that, that want to provide MOOC course, and also they have their own target, their own learner, that they want to provide to them. But, well, but there are also many uh, MOOC course provider, TPQI, OCSC, the civil service, all they have their own target, but the, their target are overlap. Or maybe uh, many one of us has more than one head. Sometimes we are uh, civil service, sometimes we are uh, uh, engineer, something like this. So uh, it is a good way that we can combine all courses from all provider into one place and provide it a simple way to the learner and all provider can utilize, can, can uh, uh, provide the course to all people in all ages as their target. So benefit both the provider and benefit both the learner. So as a government organization that initiative uh, the time MOOC, so we have to concern about, we have to uh, focus more on the developing of the platform. So if we have a national MOOC platform that all uh, major MOOC provider uh, want to uh, provide the MOOC course via this platform, you can see that the benefit will, will uh, benefit to all learner and all provider. The investment will be more efficient. 
the quality of ed education will be uh, improved. If we can uh, consolidate, coordinate, we can do a research, we can combine our research together and make a good guideline for MOOC course development, the learner will get a good consolidation of the learning portfolio. And uh, with the strong and reliable of the infrastructure and also the security system, we can provide a trust and confident learning outcome, learning resource from the learner. So at the first phase of time MOOC, we emphasize on establish the system, uh, try to provide the MOOC courses, uh, support the university. We, we as the project, we did not uh, create the MOOC courses by ourselves, but with the support from the university, from the university network. Uh, together, we can uh, build a lot of MOOC courses. But in the second phase now, MOOC will become the mainstream, so we have to focus more on building the strong, reliable, and fast infrastructure. We have to focus more on the quality assurance system and develop a good guideline to encourage, to facilitate all faculty or institution that want to create and provide a MOOC course. We have to create a, a security and very efficiency a credit bank system that will be the central recording of the credit and then we will be shared among all institutions that would like to utilize the learning credit of the learner. So we have to, to set the standard. And then uh, we can be the, the training, supporting service, and continue, continually research to improve the quality and do a knowledge management as a yearly uh, conference as this one. And also, uh, as a central body, maybe we can facilitate the coordination with other international MOOC or national MOOC and MOOC provider. So maybe the central portion. Okay, that's uh, the thing I would like to update uh, everyone and that's the time for lunch also. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Anuchai Tira Rieng Chai Si, for a very succinct and uh, informative presentation. Uh, probably one question, uh, it's allowed to do so. If you have, please. Everyone are hungry. <laughs> So everyone just get hungry, yeah? Okay, so I have a few announcements to make. Uh, the luncheon will be served in room 203 and 223. And also don't forget to fill up the application uh, by uh, scanning uh, the QR code at the back of your name tag. And uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to all keynote speakers, invited speakers, and most importantly, the interested participants who have shown up. And I hope to see you again at the 10 TCU International e-learning conference 2019. Thank you so very much. Kop kun krab. <laughs>